The Holy Gospel According to Mark Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Hi, everybody. It's a real delight to be here with you today and be a part of your Sunday worship and to give your pastor this small bit of relief. Our rostered ministers have been doing a magnificent job of providing opportunities for us to worship over the course of this long pandemic. But friends, it's really hard work and anything that we can do to help lighten the load that they are carrying is well worth supporting. Today, I'd like to share a few thoughts with you about the subject of vision. And I'm sure that most of you would agree that vision is a really important thing. You know very well from your own experience, both individually and as a congregation, that you need vision to carry a task through to completion. You need vision to sustain you and refresh you as you press through the bumps, turns, and valleys that we will inevitably encounter in life. There is, however, a potential danger involved in this vision business. Vision is good, but the line between being visionary and being delusional can sometimes be very fine. Let me spell out the differences I see by way of an incident that happened to me some years ago on a golf course of all places. Now, for those of you who know not the pleasure of chasing a little bouncy ball over hundreds of acres of mixed terrain, let me tell you that all golfers carry a common vision. It's the vision of the perfect shot, a drive to the pin, a smooth, effortless stroke, and perfect backswing. You can imagine the gentle arc of the ball as it climbs into the sky, perhaps a few astonished oohs and ahs from the gallery. And then lastly, you imagine the final graceful drop of the ball, pin high, and just a few feet from the cup. Well, one day it actually happened for me. The vision became a reality, a perfect shot on a 265-yard par three, followed by a gentle, dare I say casual, tap in for birdie. It had never happened before, and it's never happened since. In retrospect, I now know that I should have accepted that vision, that unique experience for what it truly was. I should have enjoyed this brief glimpse of golfing glory and then set it aside in my mind for future inspiration and guidance. But instead, I didn't do that. I immediately adopted the delusional posture of a naive visionary. I was no longer Michael, the intimate friend of sand trap and water hazard. I now stood among the great ones, a veritable tiger woods. And of course, I encountered the end which ultimately comes to all naive visionaries. And by the time I'd finished the fourth hole, I'd lost seven balls, torn up enough divots to generously sod my front lawn, and was seriously contemplating how much my clubs would fetch at our next neighborhood garage sale. My vision was left in tatters. 
not because there was anything wrong with the vision, but because I had naively assumed to have claimed and contained that vision, rather than allowing myself to be carried forward, guided, and inspired by it. Do you see the distinction? In our gospel lesson, we see elements of this dynamic played out in more sacred terms. Jesus and his disciples go up a mountain. Jesus moves on ahead and then suddenly and unexpectedly, apparent magic starts to happen. Jesus' form starts to change. He becomes like pure energy, pure light. Glorified beings seem to appear, Moses and Elijah. And then the whole episode is dramatically concluded by a mysterious voice from the heavens that proclaims this same Jesus to be God's own son. Can you imagine having such an experience? And who can really know how or what was happening? Regardless, it was extraordinary. And the response of the disciples is understandable. They're both terrified by and captivated by this vision. They want to hold on to it. They want this glorious moment to go on forever. They want to set up tents and live right there on the mountain. But as quickly as the vision had come, it was gone. In an instant, the disciples went from being privileged witnesses of the glories of heaven back to being tired fishermen huddled on the unfamiliar face of a mountainside. The vision had come, and in spite of the disciples' desire to contain it and hold on to it, it had passed just as quickly. They confused that which was temporary and transitory for that which was eternal. They confused the means with the end. That's a danger which we in the church always need to continually guard against. We too can become misdirected and confused about the means and the end in ways that can distract us from our primary mission. Let me give you a secular example of what I mean. In 1960, a Harvard business professor named Theodore Levitt wrote a classic article that focused on the dramatic decline of the railroad industry in early 20th century North America. The decline of the industry, Levitt concluded, didn't come about because people and freight no longer needed to be transported. The railroad declined, rather, because the railway managers came to believe that they were in the railroad business rather than the transportation business. They confused the means, tracks and engines, with the ends, the transportation of people and of freight. Can you see any analogies for the life of the church? Do we not sometimes function as if we were in the church business instead of the blessing business? The we exist for ourselves business as opposed to the God's mission to bless the world business? Do we not sometimes fall into the same trap of confusing the means with the ends and making it all about us, acting as if the church, our buildings, institutions, practices and beliefs were an end in and of themselves, rather than being a means by which we can support and participate in the ultimate end of advancing God's mission to bless and save the world. I believe that there are many people in our communities who are open to experiencing the kind of conversions that many people experience through Jesus' life and ministry. Many people who are coming to recognize the emptiness and hollowness of the false gospels of contemporary life. But those questioners and seekers won't look for a renewed life in a community, in a church, that doesn't provide evidence of having experienced a similar conversion, that doesn't believably express the new life that we claim to be calling others to embrace. They won't be easily drawn to the life of a church that appears to be more interested in the church business than in the blessing business. 
One of the unexpected, albeit forced, blessings of this time of pandemic has been a reordering of priorities, a renewed appreciation of the means and the ends. During this time where we've been cut off from our church buildings and from the activities and practices that receive so much of our attention and care in pre-pandemic time, we've been given the opportunity to focus on the real end and purpose of everything that we do, advancing the reign of God through faithful proclamation, prayer, and service. It's been a kind of forced reset that we really need to hang on to when the day eventually comes when we can return to some measure of normalcy in our life together. The same voice that proclaimed Jesus to be well-loved on the Mount of Transfiguration speaks that same blessing to us today. That blessing is a means and not an end. It's a means by which we are called to aid and abet the ultimate end of God's mission to bless and save the world. A means by which we are empowered to share the gospel of love and reconciliation that has been entrusted to us generously freely and extravagantly for the world's salvation. Amen.